Hey everyone, welcome to our webinar on how to make your bidding process scalable. My name is Michael Brown. I'm the founder and CEO of Swept Software. We help commercial cleaning business owners just like you find profitability faster and better manage your company so you can sleep at night. Now, I'm happy to report that Swept's customers retain their contracts 91% better than the industry standard, something I know they love and my team is very proud of. But today, we're not going to be focusing on retention of contracts. We're going to be talking about the process to win the contract in the first place. So joining me today for this webinar is the master of winning profitable contracts, Ricky Regalado. For those of you who don't know Ricky, he's the owner and founder of Rosalado Cleaning Services, a building service contractor with more than 300 employees headquartered in Chicago. He's also the founder of Route, a software platform for the building service industry that empowers companies with data, sales, and human capital management tools. Ricky has experienced tremendous growth in his company for the past few years. Um, he's really established himself as a leader within his region, but truly across to all of America. So Ricky, my friend, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, man, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. These, these sessions are always great, so I'm, I'm excited to join. Yeah, we've got a number of questions uh, lined up to put you on the spot, and we're also going to be uh, QA is set up, so feel free, anyone, to throw some questions in along the way. Um, we're going to launch a couple polls to get a sense of everyone who's with us today joining live. That will help Ricky and I cater the discussion to the size of your company, and will also help us with the Q&A. So feel free, throw, uh, throw your questions in the chat and fill out the poll. I'll also note that we can't see the results. Uh, we can see the results, but we can't see who's actually responded. So it's completely anonymous. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we'll kick that off. While we're waiting for the results, um, I'm going to jump in on something before we touch on bidding, um, you know, getting into some of the questions. But Ricky, you have perfected the bidding process. You've driven sustainable growth. You've been in business for a number of years. So you've proven that this is working. And you've taken it a step further by building route to share these lessons with the industry. But what I think is wonderful, like when I think of you, what stands out is how you position yourself as a connector in the industry. So I've known you for a number of years and I've watched you bring other cleaning companies under your wing. Um, you're an open book, you share your experiences, you help them grow. And before we start talking about the bidding, I just wanna understand your philosophy, like why, why you've you know, kind of positioned yourself in that way. It's an industry that's so competitive People are kind of secretive on their bidding and they're quite secretive in general, very competitive, um, but you've approached the industry completely differently. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, why and kind of what the, that outcome has been. Uh, man, you know, I, I hear it all the time, right? Like, Rick, why do you share so much? You know, like this, this it's your formula, you know, like that's, they're going to take business from you, you know, like they could turn around and take business. Like, I, it, I, can't, I couldn't believe the nature of, of this industry, uh, just because I, I come, you know, my father and my mother taught me a lot of, just a lot of things as growing up. And, you know, I, it was sharing was everything, right? Like I, I'm a big family yeah. person. So family was everything. And I, I just, I don't like to do the things on my own. I like to do things with people. I like to collaborate. I like to share in the wins. So it was just easy for me, like as, as we had opportunities to grow the business, you know, I was like, easy. I'll find another small cleaning company, team up with them. Right. In the beginning, yeah. people were just like, what are you talking about? Like, why, how could you, how could you trust them? They're like, you know, they're walking into your account. They're going to take so many negatives. You know And I'm like, man, I'm just, I'm a very positive person. Everybody knows that in my office, they're like, you're too positive, like slow down. <laughs> but uh, it's just, it, it, but it's worked. Right. So it's like, you know, just trust the process, trust, don't look in the negative of things. If you empower the people around you and you and me in this case i empower the industry good things will come out yes some negatives will occur um but i i just it just came natural man to be honest there's no real real like direct answer it was just a natural process for me to say i am going to share this knowledge right because in the end of the day you you can't take away my family you can't take away my my competitive advantage is my family is the culture that i built Mm. So those are things that are, that are just, you know, there's no proprietary system. I bid the way you, you bid, the way that person's bid. It's just a little different, right? So yep. that's why I think this is a great session that we're going to touch on because it's very possible to scale the way you bid and scale your business. There's just things that you got to have, you know, intact before you even think about doing that. 
That's awesome. Do you find that the companies you're connecting with, because I think, I believe we've spoken in the past, you've opened up your office and brought people in to see how you like deal with supplies and like how you run your whole organization. Um, are you yeah. still doing that? I mean, COVID might have put a bit of a, a twist on that, but. No, yeah, we do. I have at least two to three cleaning companies that will fly in, uh, come into the office and, you know, and we're, we're now just even opening it up to, you know, any, there's a lot of people that reach out because like, you know, we've talked about this is yeah. when you're starting off in the clean business, it's lonely, it's tough, it's scary. There's, you're wearing all the hats that you have to wear, right? Sales, yeah, sales is a care for everything, but shit, you can't even do sales if you don't have an operation system first. Totally. So there's a lot of facets of business where in a day I can have them come into the office because it's not me that does everything. So that's why I'm always like, I'm not a coach. You know, yes, I could be there to support you, but you've got to meet the team. You've got to meet the way we do business on a daily basis, meet payroll, meet the accounting department, meet the payroll department, meet every department yeah. so that you can see how they operate and work on that on a daily basis because it's real, right? Nothing's better than real life scenarios. So they get so much out of just one day where I'm like, go back and implement something that you came here and learned. Because again, it, there's no secret sauce. Like the, the way things are done, I, everybody else should be doing them in some sort of way like that or their own twist to it, really. Yeah, that's awesome. I think I hear your family in the background. That happens, my little guy, he's nuts. <laughs> I love it. I have a four-year-old and a eight-week-old right now. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun running a business with a, with a family around. Um, awesome, so I'll just share quickly in terms of the results from the polls. So about 87% of people here typically clean for general business office. Um, there's filtration throughout some of the other, you know, 24% in retail, 57% public spaces, but we've got a lot of people in the, in the target area of, what, of the work that you've been doing, Ricky. Um, in terms of how many, uh, a span on revenue, um, it's split up pretty well. About 25% are from zero to 250K, uh, 250K to 750K is about 30%. Um, and then over a million and a half, there's about 37% there. So we've actually got a, a range of people at different stages, which is going to be awesome because we're going to touch on things that uh, it doesn't really matter the size of your business, you can improve. No. So um, I'll jump right into some of the bidding stuff now. Um, our industry doesn't really have a standard way of doing anything. If you were to take a thousand cleaning companies and looked at how they manage their business, you would find 999 different ways. Um, when it comes to bidding, the one thing there's, it's kind of common is that people will get a sense of the scope of work through either square footage or, you know, people hours. Um, which system do you use? And if it's both, how do you know when to pick one over the other? Oh, yeah, man, that's a great question. And like you said, standardization, it's, it's you, you want, you know that that's what we should be doing, but it is, it is tough, right? Because, I mean, a perfect example is, 3,000 square foot restaurant is different than a 3,000 square foot office. So right there shows you, you have to do things differently. You have to, it's, it's an agile approach. Uh, I prefer to do things by the hourly, right? But the way to get to the hourly is you have to understand production rate, right? Like, I mean, they both feed each other, but we'll figure things out from the hourly standpoint. And mm -hmm. then, and again, this comes with time. So it's tough for, you know, everybody who's starting in the business, they don't have that that wherewithal or understanding of different, you know, a restaurant, a hospital, a healthcare facility, and, you know, a educational system, like all these different property types. I now, because of time in the business, have metrics that we'll go off of because we have production rates based on us as a business, because that's what I think is tough is, yes, there's some standards from like ISSA or janitorial store or other publications or areas that you get the, the basic cleaning rates, but it's like that those first couple of years or that first year, you've got to figure out your own production rate. Mm -hmm. And with, by finding out the production rate, you're going to then be able to understand what your hourly charge is. But they both go hand in hand. How would you define production rate? For, you know, we, we know there's a, a group of people in here who are fairly new. Um, how would you define production rate? So just, I mean, in basic terms, think of how many hours it's going to take you to service that account. You know, but you have to take things into consideration as far as location type, frequency, and density. Like those are the three factors that you have to understand of that location. 
And again, we could break those down, but that is what equals production rate. Yeah. I will share for all of you who are new to the industry. Um, when I started my cleaning company, I, I remember the first quote I went through, I actually cleaned the whole building myself first. So what I told them was, you know, the office manager was there, it was four floors. And they said, here's kind of the scope of work that the other cleaning company was doing. And, you know, they were missing this and this. And how long do you think it would take? What would the price be? And I said, well, what we typically do, which is to be clear, I, we didn't typically do anything. It was the first contract. I said, I like to come in. I do a full clean. I get a sense of your needs. It, I do it for free. It gives you an opportunity to see the level of work, uh, you know, and how we're going to take care of your, your, um, your office space. Um, and it gives us a sense that we, we don't have any surprises a month down the road with a, an increase in price. And they thought that was fantastic. And I cleaned the place for free. It, to me, I, it was a lesson. I'm learning. That's, that's all I was going to say, man. That is the ideal way, right? Like if we yeah. could have like a one week trial for every account that we bid and win, yeah. like you would just feel so much more confident to know because yeah. Mike, I'm, I'm what, eight year, I'm eight years into the business. Armando, one of my sales guys on the Rose Isle team, you know, we put together a bid for a school that we we still inaccurate. Even though we have a lot of our systems in place, oh. it was taking us two hours longer than we assumed and projected for. And luckily, because of the great communication, we were able to work out the scope, increase the the service charge. But it's like, well, we caught it right away. Like we knew four or five days in, we're like, damn something's wrong, we're, we're off here. That's a great point. When something's off, do you bring it up right away? 100%. Like we, especially when there's construction involved, especially when it's a brand new facility that has low density, zero, like low traffic of people coming in. This is a good time to talk about this, right? With COVID going on, occupancy is do not be afraid to bring up the conversation of, hey, you're busier than you were before. Or, hey, when we first bid this project and in the scope, these areas did not, we did not consider the amount of foot traffic. Do you want the high quality clean? Yeah. It's time is going to match that clean. And, yeah. and we have to talk about it, right? Like, or you walk away. Like literally, we walked away two accounts in the last three months that there was no meeting in between. And we knew that it was going to, cost us money, aggravation, yep. quality control, inspections, all that good stuff to continue to serve that client. And it just wasn't worth it. Where I failed in the early days, and I, you know, to me, that's the best way to teach people learn from other people's mistakes. I, I had a number of contracts where I didn't bring it up at first. I was like, no, 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 we'll keep trying. We'll keep trying. I had one contract. We lost on it for months and months and months. I tried to find efficiencies. I tried everything. And then when I went back to them, they said, well, you didn't talk to us about this before. Then they kind of thought like, well, why didn't you bring this up before? Yeah, it's, it's almost like, now it's and your fault. Like, well, because I'm novice, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. That's why I didn't. I mean, that's the honest answer. You can't say that, right? And so we end up having to split in part ways. No, nah, that's, Mike, that's that's so true. It's like, well, and think about it. I mean, this is off topic, but it's like even invoicing. When you fail to invoice somebody on time, well, hey, man, you didn't, you think I'm going to remind you? I didn't, you know, that's your job. Like, again, it's our job to assess these accounts and go back. I mean, you'd be surprised. They're not, the decision makers or the people that we're do, working with, are, they're not opposed to having the conversation. You know, you just bring it up. Yep, absolutely. I, I see a couple of questions in here. We'll do most of them during Q and A, but you know, I, I will note someone asked, um, now that we're established, do we still do the trial clean? Someone else asked that as well. Um, so to be clear, I built my company, my cleaning company, I built it into a first in my city, then a second city, then a third city, and I sold it. Um, but when I owned it, we still did that trial clean from time to time. Um, we also felt it was a good way of offering kind of a bit of a free clean to get everything at a baseline if we were gonna win that contract. And we felt if they're gonna have us in their space, they're gonna probably give it give that contract to us. So no, um, we I did that it. a lot. Now. A school, cleaning a school or a stadium or something that that's a very different uh, approach if you're taking on something like that. Um, and someone else asked, uh, you know, who did the clean? Typically, it'd be myself in the early days. Um, but then once I had, you know, top cleaners or supervisors, I could trust that they'd be able to like 
you know, this floor took me this time, this space. So they would be able to calculate and help that. And, um, and so I'd have them go in and do that. No, oh, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a great, great point. Like, I don't think I've ever told people that too, is in the beginning, we would win business. We, we bid business a little lower than we should have, but we wanted to understand like restaurants. I didn't under, I didn't know how to service a restaurant. So I went, I wanted to win the restaurant to then use that as a hands-on training session, right? Learn yeah. back of the house, floors are tough. Front of the house, the bathrooms are dirty. You've got to move chairs, you know, just because you walk in and you think there's not that much to do. Moving chairs from one side to the other takes time. So I think I like that free trial approach. Maybe couple that too with, you know, win some location types, build your portfolio of locations that you're going to service. And that first one, you may have to bid low to win it, to understand it, to go back and say, hey, this is like so-and-so, 5,000 square feet, front of the house, back of the house. You know, like we, we, we as business owners and salespeople need to know how to reference to, to build out a good bidding, you know, comparison. The other side of that is once you get into a, a, a similar contract, you get the lingo so you can go sell that next person. Like we sold, uh, we cleaned for daycares. And so I'd always be like, oh yeah, no, we love cleaning those little tiny toilets because a lot of the daycares have the small little, and they actually are the cute toilets. Um, and But they would laugh and they'd be like, oh, so like you do know my space. Like it built a little bit of trust right there. Yeah. No, I, I, that's the truth. Like, I mean, just FOH, BOH, right? Exam yeah. rooms, nurses stations, doctor's office. Like you you know those, the the lingo to say, we, we've yeah. done this before, you can trust us, so. So here's a question for you, Ricky, in terms of uh, just thinking about the price, uh, the contract and it's profitable. If you go through and you say, look, here's what's gonna cost. Um, and they say, well, we're comfortable with you knocking down the hours and knocking down the price. And we're happy without it being like exceptionally clean, like maybe to your standards, like, will you take a contract and clean it if it's profitable, but it's not really at the level that you want? Uh, I, in the beginning, the early Ricky would say yes. Right, the, the later stage, Ricky now, and especially because my operations team and my quality control team, you know, they, they really are, you know, they take this stuff to heart, right? Like they know how to match expectations, but if the client's expectations aren't even as high as their own, we will say no to those, to those contracts because again, that's just that person, right? You're dealing with that person who may not have those expectations, there's other employees, there's other employees, there's ownership, there's patrons who come into the establishment that may call that out. And what are you going to say? Oh, well, no, they didn't want it that way. They didn't want it. To... No, you're, yeah. we're the professionals. Like we have to establish what our minimums are. And, you know, like, like to, for a restaurant, right? I'm not picking up restaurants. It's just easy for me. to <laughs> So if they only want to be serviced once a week and they're open seven days a week man, you are setting yourself up for failure because that's like a deep clean every week, right? Or a, a, a medical facility. If they only want once a week cleaning, the, there's, so, there's a disconnect there. That's, they don't have a true desire to have a cleaning professional service their facility. They should just go with you know, an in-house staff at that point. And if they land in that situation and you were to accept it, which I did in the early days and you said back in the day, you would accept it too that's the customer that becomes a hassle and you end up spending a lot of time talking to them, changing scope, or it's complexity. You have someone go in and do an inspection and they think it's failed. And you're like, actually, no, in this case, it, it, it passed. It's confusing for everybody. No, it um, is. That's, that's where you true. waste a lot of money. That's a great point. Yeah. Like think about like, well, we've been guilty of our, our team will say, well, well, Rick, there's no complaints. Why, you know, why, why is this a bad inspection? But we're like, no, well, that's because we know it's a bad inspection. Like, yeah. Just because there's no complaints, don't get it twisted. You know, they're, they could be behind the scenes already looking for another service partner. And you don't even know it because you're not getting a complaint. I remember I was fired from a dentist office. Uh, I lost very few contracts. Um, and I remember this one, they called me and I picked up the phone. I was pretty happy. I was like, hey, how are, you going? How are things going? And they told me that they're canceling the contract and there were issues that they didn't report to me. And so I assumed, again, this would have been one of the first of 10 contracts I won. I assumed that because I wasn't hearing anything, like no news is good news, but no news is actually potentially you're going to be fired and you don't yeah. know. 
that. I mean, to talk about you got to foster that relationship. That, that's something we could talk about later on too. It's just, you know, everybody's so worried about new business. It's like your current business is a resource for new business, right? It's, it's unless you're doing everything in that facility, you better be trying to get and go after all of those services opportunities that you can get. Totally. So now let's, uh, we've got an idea on scope of work and, you know, how to measure that and tie it to the production rate. Um, I want to shift gears to supplies. So what's the best practice for estimating supply costs? Do you use a formula and how accurate yeah. is it? Oh man, great question. I wish I could tell you a little more, but I cannot. Um, but as far as formula, again, early Ricky, we were using three to 5%, right? Like we were using a percentage of what the monthly service charge is going to be. Uh, and then also we calculated into the, into effect was occupancy, right? Especially if you're doing consumables, like yeah. that, that's the one that gets a lot of people that got me in the beginning where I didn't understand how to correctly uh, project for how much toilet is going to be used, how much garbage liners are going to be used, right? Like these are things you just know. What's going on? Are your employees stealing the <laughs> the paper well, no, towel that you know that I'm buying? Like, what's going on? Yeah. Well, no, I, no. Think, think about the client side, right? Like, if you're buying. That's what I mean. The clients, the employees. Oh yeah. No, that. Yeah. They've got 40 employees, and uh, you know, toilet paper is going out at a different rate than what it should be, right? That's, and that happens. And it happens, but it's like you. That costs you money if you inaccurately bid that in the beginning. So it's like it's a catch twenty two. It's an, a, a stream of additional revenue for you to take on. It's supply ordering, you yeah, know, inventory management, but. At the same time, if you don't have a system for it, you shouldn't take it on because it could, if you think you're making 25, 30% margins, you may be making, you know, 18, 16% because if you're using a percentage to go off of, which is what I think is wrong right now is it's hard to use a percentage because what if the consumption changes? You know, what if you change from, you know, a $7.32 per gallon product that jumps up to $11 and 32 cents and you multiply the usage over that again, like we've got to start understanding what the exact dollar amount is to the penny, but you know, summarize that categorize that as a line item on our bid and then mm -hmm. send that to the client. So then they can see that, Hey, based off of usage, based off of consumption, if I am paying X or if I am charging you X amount or including this charge, you know, $242.52. That's for this amount of supply. Mm -hmm. so when, if it goes higher, you've got something to go back to to say, I can, you know, I can charge you more. Because yeah. the worst thing when using a, a lump sum is you can't go back to the client. They don't understand where you got to a, a totally. price and they're going to say, no, that's on you. You know, you, it's nowhere yeah. in my contract service agreement. Are you responsible if, with, with Roslato? Are you guys responsible for the majority of the supplies for your clients, or do you have some of your clients who manage them themselves? Uh, it's probably like 50 50. But we've got the system now that, you know, we are very, we feel confident in being able to buy better, buy faster, and buy yep. efficiently. So yep. uh, you know, our pricing now, when we show them what our supply kit or supply list looks like and our pricing points, they end up choosing us and say, go ahead take over the supply ordering because yeah. you you actually receive a better price and then you as a as a bsc or a commercial cleaning company you become more valuable now right because you you are able to buy better than they can and you can now buy better from the supplier because you're buying for your clients which again we know the more you buy the better price you get and again, when you think about how you position your company in comparison to somebody else who's giving this low price bid when you're talking and saying like, you know, I've got a great relationship. I have buying power because of all the contracts I'm servicing. I can get, you know, a better rate than you can. Then they go, oh, this is a legit company. You know, yeah, this no, is not oh, yeah. Like, it's almost like you're, you're, you're boasting about your resume a little bit there, right? Like, exactly. hey, I have Home Depot Pro as my supply partner. I've got Staples yeah. as a supply partner. Wherever you are in the Midwest, I can deliver, right? I can ship to like you start using like drop ship terms, they're like, oh, wow, this, you know, they've got a system, they've got a process, there's value on yeah. top of just cleaning. Yeah, absolutely. So um, thinking about the on-site visit, um, as you talked about, you know, you've got schools, restaurants, this and that. If you're in a situation where the contract is different, it's your first time going through, 
do you take someone like a second person to the bid? Do you do multiple visits? Um, because the reality of it is if you win a bid and you're low priced, you're stuck with a, a contract that's not profitable, but also just as risky, you know, is if you bid too high and you miss out on a really good contract. So do you get a second set of eyes or how do you, oh, how do you manage that? No, Mike, we could go all day on this. This is my favorite part. Right? <laughs> this is my favorite. This is why I created route, right? It's, in the beginning, I was doing everything myself. And the process back then was, uh, you know, a supervisor, uh, quality control trainer, you know, whoever these roles were within my business, we had kind of a system of who gets the handoff after the contract is done. They would arrive. And, you know, before it was, there was no, there was nothing to reference, right? Yeah, I have some photos and I had an email gathered and put together, but they started to just like, you know, Rick, we didn't know this. I didn't know this. You didn't calculate that. We forgot about that. We, I didn't know I was walking into this. Where's the supply closet? Where There was a very big disconnect from sales to operations. So it's like, I struggled for many years to say operations should be involved with sales. Sales should be involved with, with operations. But in the beginning, remember, I was doing it all myself. You know, you were doing it all. So we didn't know- you were marketing, sales, HR, operations, yeah. all of it. So. We forget and we just assume that that, you know, that, oh, I'm going to hand it off. They're going to start. They're going to get there. There was times they didn't even know what door to enter. Like, that's the type of information I forgot to share. So with yeah. Route, we were like, man, we've got to create a portrait of the space, capture images, break down area by area, get, you know, create a, a hot point list and then send that to the team. So then they almost have like a new account startup, mm. portrait, right? Where it's not just pictures, it's where do I start? It's bring this type of hose to the janitor closet. It's this janitor cart's not gonna fit in the closet. You need a garbage with a dolly. You need a skirt, not a cart. You need you know, all these little things you can put into that walkthrough because to me, if you don't do a, a good walkthrough, you, you've missed an opportunity to start the account the right way. But okay. to answer the question too, on there's a final walkthrough. You should always do two walkthroughs. There's the walkthrough that the salesperson did to initially yeah. bid. Then there's the final walkthrough to confirm the price that you are about to submit an offer to the client. And then they look at that sometimes, you know, when they look at us to say, you're coming again, like you're, mm -hmm. oh, you're doing another walkthrough. We're like, yes, now it's operations. And we're confirming that the price we're going to give you is fair because now I have the team that is actually going to service the account. Who's going to train them is coming in. So it's like, there's the initial walkthrough that's quick, a couple big, you know, get the scope of everything. Then there's a final that is your layout with everything defined. So when you submit that proposal, you're setting every department up for success. And that client on the other side sees that this is a custom proposal for them based on the walkthrough, which oh, by the way, is inside of the proposal because we captured everything for you. Yeah, it's awesome. When I think back with my company, our, our slogan was we focus on our cleaners so they can focus on you. And our philosophy, our belief was that if, if we take care of our cleaners and set them up for success, they're going to do the right thing. And most right. times people don't train their cleaners. They, and to be not being critical, I understand you're hiring, you're, you're doing everything and it's really tough to build that training plan. Um, but you send someone in who's there to do the service and protect your revenue stream and you send them in completely blind. They yeah. don't, know, they don't know what to do. I mean, that's why we built swept and it, it, it sounds like in a lot of ways it's why you designed route the way you have. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I'm telling you, man, like it's no, no, uh, how do you say, it? I forgot how you say it, but we're talking right now. And it's funny because like literally route and swept is what we use to, the, to operate our business. Right. You know, Dominic. Dominic swears by all these processes. He's got this whole framework on how to do things, but it includes both of our systems, right? Because in one, in one side, we're worried about the front end. And like you said, setting up the cleaners for success. So then when the trainer, because nothing's more important than that trainer and quality control and supervisor to feel like, hey, the sales team cared about us. They gave us everything we needed to start this account the right way from minute one Look at, they even told us where the second key box is. They told us which garbage can to go through. Yep. These are details that now the cleaners need to do their job, which the trainer first, the trainer needs, because how are they gonna train if, the, if they don't even have the details in the first place? 
So it's like, it's real, it's a trigger, man. Everything, every stage triggers. And that's why for us, it's like, we do so much stuff in route, then we do this stuff in SWEP, then we have, we go back to reference vote. Like, it's a hub of information that if I didn't go into the office for one week, I could log into these systems and know where I stand with these accounts. That's the important piece. That's why data is so important now more than ever. And people talk about company culture as well. So you you own a cleaning company. You've got people, you know, everyone here has cleaners that are going out in the middle of the night. You know, you don't see them all the time. Like, well, how do you build a company culture? Well, when a cleaner shows up and they know what's expected of them and they feel supported, that's part of your culture. Like 100%. it's, the, it's yeah. the process. And I have to, I have to be just super open and honest. Process drives me crazy. It, I know, I know how like I'm not the guy for that. Now. I realized all of my mistakes along the way. And I've, you know, I, I learned to leverage it appropriately, but I'm not someone who can deal with like too much process. It makes me itch. Right. But there's a certain amount that just makes everything smooth. And I, I think that's, it's finding that balance in your company and people feel that otherwise they're like, especially when you have someone who doesn't show up. So if someone quits on you, you call your best cleaner, you get them to go in and they go in completely blind. And they're like, why am I doing this? Like, I'm bailing you out and you're sending me into a mess. Yeah, you create you create a disgruntled first impression with, you know, because I remember when I had to go in and, and this is, again, this is why I feel like, you know, you have to sell to get right. Like, you know, my motto, right? Sell together, sell faster, sell better, where the more people involved in the sales process from operations, the better your system is going to be because everybody understands every aspect of the business. Um, again, when you're in the, when you're starting off, it's tough. You're wearing all the hats, but like who better to know that than, than you? And then you start to delegate that and share that because I'm telling you, man, it starts with the walkthrough. You know, I mean, it, it, it really does. And it, that's why I, I'm not even opposed to when the actual cleaner, Mike, I've had, I've actually had the cleaner who's, who we know ahead of time. You know, there's certain situations that we're like, we already know the cleaner for this project. Yeah, you know, we ask for that second walkthrough because that's the thing. You always you're gonna get one walkthrough, but the second one is almost you as the professional have to ask for it. Yeah, um, and that you know to to ensure a, a good transition, I may bring them there, right? Because now think about the buy-in from the cleaner when they're like, like, what am I? Oh, you want me to go? Yeah, I know. That's, that's I how important you are to this because if we start from day one the right way. You know, and you'll be surprised. A lot of your cleaners will start to say, hey, you know what? I noticed that by day three, I got faster here. I was able to do this, but I need this tool, right? Yep. Or I need, because they heard it from the client first, expectations that said, hey, this room is super important. Sometimes those things get lost in translation, you know, and the cleaner to be a part of that, again, it doesn't always happen. But I'll tell you in the beginning for me, I was able to do that because I was the the bit, the owner, the sales yep. guy, the quality control, the inspector. It's like the quicker I can get my cleaner to know what the client's expectation is, the quicker I can get off that account and go win more business. Totally. And I think, you know, we're here talking about bidding and, you know, we're touching on culture and, and cleaner retention. It's, it's one of those things that's so tough to find good cleaners and bring them in and, and, and retain them. But when you bring them to a contract, so I've done this many times as well. What's that tell them? You trust them. Yeah. They take ownership. They take ownership in a way that you couldn't possibly pay them. Wouldn't matter what you pay them per hour. They'd never take that same ownership because they feel appreciated. And it's free to do that. Oh, know? yeah. It doesn't and I think that's anything. Yeah. yeah. When you think about the experience, they probably work for you and, and multiple other cleaning companies. So you have this opportunity to share with them and, and build them up. Um, it's, you know, anyway. Oh, I can, yeah. I can and that's almost like, yeah, again, it's like, you know, we're talking about sales, but guess who's your best salesperson? Is your team. Your teams are your salespeople. Like, the more that your team can sell the services you offer and, and just always be selling, right? ABS out in the grocery market, the bank, the picnic, the kid's birthday party. Like, the more they know what you do as an, as an operations and how you do it, man, you've got a sales team right there. You know, people talk about, you know, when do you hire your first salesperson? I didn't hire my first salesperson until five years in because I had the team selling with me. Yeah. So let's talk about this. Um, people setting a price in their city. So 
of course, you know what the price is in Chicago and you, and you likely because of all the partnerships you've built, you know, throughout the US, you, you'd know a number of cities, but how do you, when you started, what did you do to figure out what the price was? And if the price starts changing in a community for a number of reasons, like how do you kind of calibrate and recalibrate that? Matt, that's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, like in some cases, when, when we're talking multi-location type of clients, which those are the ones I thrive with, uh, they actually don't care that, you know, oh, it's expensive here, it's less expensive there. All they want is a consistent fixed price because they are doing you a, a favor. They're giving you multiple locations and trust me, they'll never forget that. So it's our job as the business owner to know there is gonna be some loss leaders, right? There's gonna be some areas that we may not make as much, but we've got to try to stick to a consistent rate, which like for me, I know East Coast costs more than the Midwest, right? West Coast is a little pricier than the Midwest. The Southwest is a little different. Their minimum wage is lower, right? But we try to keep a consistent price point so that it's easier for, for the, the buyer in this scenario to know that, hey, we're taking care of them. You know, because it, I'll tell you a perfect example. I've got, um, I think you know Evelyn, right, in Texas. Mm -hmm. you know, she's in, uh, in Austin. Uh, they price cents per square feet. You know, they take occupancy into consideration. We, I never did that here. In Chicago, we, we would just price the square footage of the building. It didn't really men, uh, matter what the ten, tenant occupancy was. So you learn from others. That's why I'm so big on teaming up with other companies because it's crazy. You can learn new tricks from even a cleaning business owner that has two employees, has just started. He's entering into the market with some knowledge from another line of business that, hey, it, it, could, it could resonate within our space too. One of the ways I found out uh, the price in my city was I had my competitors uh, I did under, under, undercover demos and had them quote on a friend's business. And so they would go through and they'd quote the space and I would also quote the space. So I had something to compare and that's how I learned. And I, you know, I brought in a franchise and I brought in some independence and, you know, that's just life. You know, you're, you're in business, you're trying to learn. It's nothing against no. them. You know, I would yeah. expect they would do the same against me if I'm out winning bids and, you know, how do you get that edge? Um, and for me, it was a great learning opportunity because, you know, in the beginning when you're small, I, I remember I walked through an RFP and people were intentionally throwing me off. They go through, oh, geez, you're going to have to do this and do, oh, and they're making these notes. Yeah. Like, oh, really? I didn't know that. And then someone came up and said, he's just bugging you. He's, he's trying to throw you off. And I'm that, like, that oh. happened to me too. Yeah. Right? Especially yeah, the, the cattle walkthroughs, right? Like when you're walking with 10 other cleaning companies, that happened to me too. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, oh yeah, you're, you're gonna have to clean this whole back warehouse. Oh, yeah. You better yeah. make sure that. It's, like, it's hilarious. No. It, it just makes the learning curve a, a bit steeper. Um, so again, when it comes to finding a, a fair price, you know, is it the you know people hours? Is it the square footage? How how do you you know we talk about finding the scope of work, but when you're actually applying that price, what are you doing when you're finalizing it? Well, no, I mean, if, if we're talking about scaling the business too, you want, again, you know, time and experience is going to give you the opportunity to get to a cents per square feet. Like I now, eight years in, we have metrics that are cents per square feet for janitorial, for mm -hmm. health care. We have uh, janitorial for restaurants, and we have janitorial for office space. Those are three categories that I could tell you my cents per square feet, no matter what, right? And then we have our cents per square feet based on uh, post-construction cleaning, right? Floor services. Those are all broken down now because it's easy to scale a, a multi-location bid doing it that way than having to figure out per hour. But like the one-off locations and the smaller scope of work and the smaller jobs, it's easier to, to create an hourly rate for those. But like yeah. hourly rate, again, I have my hourly rate because I know that my cost is X because it includes FICA, workman's comp, health insurance, janitorial bond, supply costs, equipment, drive, overhead. Like, I know what my cost is. I know what I want to make on top of that. So I'm assuming it's fair to say, uh, you know, we touch on a, <clears throat> a number of points on how to put a bid together and price and scope of work and supplies and things like that. And to make it scalable, all the stuff you're talking about is in route. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, and, and that's why, like, you know, we're working on 2.0 right now to make it even more user friendly because mm -hmm. the, you know, the estimator is complex, you know, because we included so much, but we want to eliminate the data inputs and almost really just get to the point where we are spitting this information out for you, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, again, a lot of our experience and a lot of, you know, people like you, other people in the industry, they're, they're, they're sharing. People are starting to share knowledge now because what it's going to do is improve that bottom line, right? That if we can raise the bar for our industry and the clientele now knows that they have to pay, pay 25, 26, 28, 30 an hour. Why? Because we're covering this line item, that line item, this line item. Our cost as an organization is 19, 20 bucks an hour. So how the hell can I charge you 21, 22? Totally. If you as a client tell me that the guy down the street's charging me 20. Well, I want to call you out on that line and say, put his bid to my bid, show me the line items and the costs that he's covered to run an established business, to grow and to pay, totally. pay people a good wage to earn a living in that city. Go ahead, show it to me. They yeah. won't be able to show it to you because they won't have it. And what they'll do is they'll ask you to meet their price and do your scope of work. Yeah. You know? And I think, so you, you talk about the complexity of the estimator. Um, it's one of those things like, do you want to put a little bit of time in up front? Or do you want to lose money every single month until you fire that? Like you don't make money in the first month of winning a bid. It, you know, no. it's you want them long term. And so, you know, I would encourage people. We always say we're super busy. There's too many things to do. Like block time in your calendar. Prioritize. And this is the foundation. People who win low performing in, ter in terms of profitability contracts or high touch with clients, and you're not making enough money. Those are the same people that don't have time to train their cleaners. Same people who, you know, you're not making enough money to run a proper business and you get in, you start spiraling. And yeah. I think it's the discipline up front. It just really sets the tone for everything in your company. Yeah, man, Mike, I mean, this, you know, we could probably talk about this offline, but I, man, I would tell you, we've got so much data probably between us two to start to establish what these location types, production times really should be, right? Because I know a lot of people struggle with, there's so much to do in a walkthrough. There's so much information to gather when you're trying to sell, because what do we want to do as, as business owners? We got to turn that proposal over pretty quickly because yeah. others will, where if we could start to figure out some of these assumptions, like, and then set them as, you know, almost defaults and understand certain location types, because yeah. there's not that many, man, the categories, you know, nope. It's like 10 or under, right? 12. And again, it's your niche. You should only do what you want to do. Like you're talking daycare. You start with one. You go start in and you one. nail it. And then start you, with one. you double down on that. Yeah, and double. Yeah, exactly. Like me, you know, on Rosalado's side, we love healthcare. We know it. We live it. We breathe it. We know the floor types. We know what it's going to take to service that client. We know how to meet expectations. We, we could, and we are doing walkthroughs in other cities and states and then the bid is being worked on in Chicago without ever seeing that space because we know it that well. So it's like, you got to get to that point, right? Get, and, and with that comes time, comes experience, but really comes doing the work, man, doing the work yourself to really get to the point that you could, you could know every aspect of pricing because it all starts with the sale. Totally. So in terms of, you made a, a comment about the proposal how fast do you get them turned around and and also do you offer tiered pricing like you know oh yeah bronze silver gold whatever the case is you know and make a recommendation because there's there's room to you know clean a place three days a week or four or to add yeah. in additional services and you know quarterly carpet cleanings and whatnot like how do you what does that kind of proposal look like and how quickly do you flip it Oh man, I mean, you could turn, we could go for, depending on the size, depending on the client that you're looking at, depending on what they're looking for. Uh, you know, I've turned proposals within an hour, right? From mm -hmm. the walkthrough to the, to the estimating calculator, right? To then creating the proposal, literally one hour, right? And that's because I, I was confident in the pricing that we've done. And then in the proposal, you nailed it, right? Like I love to actually give more than I need. They call those for janitorial, right? I always tell everybody, you saw that they have carpet, you saw that they have 42 windows, which you times it by two for window panes. You saw that they have ceramic tile in the bathroom and you saw that they have BCT in the back area. Yeah. Give a price for all three or four of those because what you do, you gather the square footage. You know your pricing, include it in there, highlight it, you know, call out what it is with the picture, 
you'd be surprised how many times they say, after you just told them in the walkthrough, that you do window washing, when you give them a price, wow, Rick, I didn't even know you did window washing. Dude, I told you in the walkthrough. What do you mean? So it's again, out of sight, out of mind. So in the proposal, that's when you share your story, right? Tell them that you do window washing. Here's the price point. This is at one time a month. This is a three day a week uh, price point. This is a five day a week price point. Here's, you'll, they'll see a difference, right? From the five to three a days, you should always price it a little different from the three to five. Why? Because if you're going every day, there's room to not have to hit and touch everything, right? And then give them a carpet four times a year, give them a VCT stripping, you know, refinish one time a year. Yeah. They'll start to look at this like, wow, you are a complete service company. Yeah. I don't need carpet cleaning, but this is good to know. And you know what? We're a retail storefront. We need to make good first impression. Throw that one time a month window washing in there for me. Or what could, it opens the door for negotiations. When you add yeah. so many service prices and you show the ability to be flexible, you'd be, again, clients start to say, holy cow, you I didn't know you did so much. And now you're neg negotiating on scope of work and value for them instead of uh, this person, you know, kind of showed up and wrote on a napkin that they do it for less. It's like, if that's what we're comparing, maybe you should go take them because I think that's probably not going to work out well. And I would say on the contracts I walked away from like that, I would call them in a month or two months and just say, how's it going? Every once in a while, it was going really well. It was a small cleaning company that, you know, didn't have any as much overhead and they, you know, they won that contract and did well, but a lot of times they were, they failed them. No, I knew and Think about what you just said there too is, Again, why, why we have to do a digital approach to this to scale, right? Is if they called me back, which this happened many times, six months later, I've got that entire walkthrough. I've got all, yeah. all the pricing that I did six months ago. Yeah. I don't have to go back for a walkthrough. I could just say, hey, did the scope change? Did you need anything? No? Okay, here, I'm gonna submit the proposal the same day you just requested it. And then it's easy because of the way we you can download everything. Mike, that, you know, our next step is Dominic takes that, puts it into the instructions and SWEP. Yep. And we're off to the races. Like we could start that account the next day. If you called us to say yes to a contract that you said no to six months ago, because nothing's changed. And then the team now has everything in the SWEP instructions to then yep. go, go clock in tomorrow, start working. Exactly. Right? Because so we've got you, all the data, man. That's it. You match the price today to try to win it. Or do you let them learn a bit of a lesson? You know, that's the thing. I've done both, right? No, I have done both. I really have. Hey, man, minimum wage went up. This has changed, right? Six months later, no. But most of the time, if we really want to win that business and we care about them as a client, you know, we'll honor the same price. You know, you don't, you know, because then they're going to, you just open the door for them to say no if you if you go and up the price. So, Ricky, I'm going to slide us over to QA. I still have more questions for you, but, you know, I look at the time, man, we could, we could talk for hours. Um, but uh, quickly, before we slide over, I, I, I have a bit of an offer for SWEP, just for everyone who's here. Uh, we're doing 50% off on our Grow package, Excel package, and Master package for three months. It's for all new clients. It does not include the start package. Um, so Jess will share a link or some way communicate that. Uh, but I just wanted to let everybody know for joining uh, that offers out there. And now we'll move into, uh, into Q&A. So um, we have a whole list of questions. I'm just gonna start at the top. We're gonna work our way through. Um, so from Alex, um, at what point in your business did you hire your first salesperson? Uh, so I'll share for myself, it was about two years in um, is when we, uh, we started to scale and we started to get into other cities and that's when we had to, had to start bringing on the salespeople. Um, I would say five, five years in is when I hired and, and that guy didn't come from the space. And again, it was easy to show him and, you know, and guide him through everything. Cause we started to digitize that, but five years in, he became now, he is our special services salesperson and we have another salesperson. That is, so we're to date three, but we started five years ago. Yeah. I'll also make a note. Um, the person who came in and joined us, they owned a cleaning company before. So if you were to check on, on LinkedIn or you, there are ways to find people that own businesses, sold them, moved into different industries. 
And in this particular person, he, he's amazing. He came in, he started training. He started doing training in the, in, you know, for a few hours a week for extra money, uh, you know, for his family. And eventually he came over full time. Um, but there's all sorts of ways to bring someone in to help level your business up. You know, they could have been in the business for a number of years and sold and, and have a real passion. I find a lot of people in this industry, you know, love this industry and have a lot of pride. And so there's ways to uh, level up your business no, uh, part-time hires too. That's a good point. Um, Bonnie, um, do you use ISA or other industry organization standards to help with bidding? Uh, I did at first, but that's where I say it's a good way. It's a good foundation, right? It is a good basis. They get very detailed and granular. So mm -hmm. again, I wouldn't put all my eggs in that basket and, and send off a proposal based on that because I mean, you're, it's, it's just not you as a company. You may operate differently. You may be using different equipment. Again, try to start to create yours. It's, it, uh, there's going to take a little time for that to happen, but it's always a good way to just show, you know, almost double check your work. Am I, am I way off? You know, am I close to there? So I'd say it's a good, it's good for reference points, Bonnie. Bonnie also asked if now that we're established, we still go in and do trout cleans, but I think we, we touched on that. It's a great, I, I would you know suggest everyone on the call, try that out, pick a medium sized contract and go in and, uh, and you know, just see number one, what you learn by doing that free clean uh, and how the client responds. Because you would look at what's the cost to acquire a client. And so if you go into a space and clean it for three or four hours and just write that off, but you win a contract that you keep for six years, that could be a great uh, sales technique uh, as well as for the bidding side. No, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, let me see. As it relates to payroll processing, which do you prefer, W-2s or 1099 and why? Uh, that's a great question. Again, in the beginning, Mike, I don't know about you, but we, we did a lot of 1099, right? Because we cash flow was very important for us. We, we didn't have, I think for the first three years is when we, we would, so I don't know if this is the best advice to give, but we, we would uh, really like cluster accounts and come up with a lump sum price and say like, hey, you know, Mike and John, you know, here's your three accounts. Here's the scope of work. Here's the areas. Here, it's 2000 a month that I'll pay you. Mm. you know, again, we got to that price by hours that it's going to take to clean. And, you know, but we gave them a little leeway. And it was good for us because then we figured out fixed costs in the beginning, but very quickly as you grow, you, you'll start to figure out you cannot have that many 1099s unless they are legitimate 1099s with work bids comp, janitorial bond. I mean, trust me, you've got to have all your ducks in a row and okay. covered. But in the beginning, you know, you, you're growing. You, not that you can get away with doing it, but it's a good creative approach to save some money and put some money in the bank account to, to create some capital. Um, yeah. But then you do ultimately want to go to W-2 because W-2 employees are the ones that are going to buy in. They're the ones that are going to have the culture fit. Uh, yeah. And those are the ones that are going to grow with you as a company. Because a 1099, they're, it's, it's what it's called. They're an independent contract. Right? Totally. So they're, they're not dependent on you for the most part. One thing I noticed was the style of work and the time of day. So for me, um, that independent contractor was great if they wanted to pick up a couple shifts a week in the evenings or weekends, and they had another job. They, they were not dependent on us. This was their, you know, travel money. They're going to buy whatever, buy an, a, another car, whatever it was. So we were kind of like, it was a great dynamic, but they were not the people, of course, doing 40 hours a week. Otherwise, they're not 1099 anymore. So there's a certain level of uh, what I found professionalism and uh, you could really depend on them and count on them. So they're very really consistent, but it's hard to scale and grow your business. No, that, that, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so from Jackie, I'd love to start using production rates, but I often find those discussions confusing. The rate times square foot per month per cleaning. None of the results I produce using square foot ever work out anywhere near close to what I charge for current accounts. Any thoughts on this? Yeah. That Trust me, I still do. I still deal with that. But again, that's why it's, if you have both and you, I almost tell everybody, right? Like even, you know, Armando would be the first to tell you from my team is do both. Come up with, try to figure mm -hmm. it out hourly wise, try to figure it out square foot, cents per square feet, because she's exactly right. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense. And you're like, I, I think I should be charging this, 
but this formula tells me this. So it's like, you've got to start to, to really think to yourself and say, what, what is it going to take to service that account? And what, what account do I have that is similar that could show as some type of a comparison model so that I can know I'm at least as accurate as I can be. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, that's a tough question because she's right. I mean, it's, it's sometimes you feel like you're off, right? But then sometimes you don't, right? I mean, sometimes it does work out and you nail it, but that's just, it's, it's hard to use that as a consistent model over and over again. So that's why I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of just get to a price, a monthly service charge by both approaches. Awesome. So Stephanie asked about marketing tools that you're doing to grow your business. So uh, she knows that she drives around, drops off flyers, especially before COVID, but now a lot of locations are closed. Um, she's currently using LinkedIn um, and, you know, looking for people in operations or facility managers. Um, how, how are you growing the business? Well, you know, we talked about this, you know, earlier is your website. You know, your website is the area that you can share your story and, and tell people who you are as a business owner, what your culture is, the services you offer, and then you allow them to get to know you, right? Remember, we're, we're, you're a brand. In this industry, if you establish a brand within that, your region, like everybody in, my, in Chicago knows the R, right? They know the black and white logo that's coming out everywhere. They know, you know, we're branded everywhere. Um, I really don't do any marketing, right? Like we don't do any decals. We don't do flyers. We don't do AdWords, Google camp, not nothing, right? Because we, we focus on the website. Everybody's going to search for you. Everybody's going to find you. What I would say is reviews. Make sure you get as many reviews as you can. Because yeah. you'd be surprised when, when you're looking and, and you know, the, the organic, you know, the Google map pops up and it, you know, pinpoints like six or seven locations around your area. People look at reviews. Like, who am I dealing with? What what, what kind of reviews is this business getting? Then mm. the next thing they do is click your website. Like it's right there. You know, the, the flyers and I mean, it's good. I get, I get, I, I'd say use your vehicles as an advertisement. If anything, if you're going to you know invest the money into a vehicle, brand the vehicle, drive that puppy everywhere, leave it parked out in the, you know, a far parking spot on a big main road. So they get to know what that logo looks like. I mean, that's really what's worked for me. That's awesome. So I will note we're almost at time. Rick, do you have a few minutes to, to extend for a few more questions? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just pushed my next meeting by, by 10 minutes. Um, there's a, a whole list of questions and people are really engaged. So I want to keep adding the value. Um, so someone asked about the admin. Sometimes they get in to do a walkthrough and the admin is actually kind of rushing them. They don't want them to slow down. How do you handle that? You know, even when yeah. they, they said they, they prepped them on the phone, so it's going to take some time to get in there. They're trying to run you through. What, what no, do you yeah, that? That, that, that is the unfortunate part of our business, right? I mean, we run into that all the time. So you really don't know what you're going to walk into. But what that, you know, just by saying, prepping them, talking to them on the phone, setting up some kind of expectations of what you're going to do on the walkthrough, it, it helps. It, 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 you should be doing that. But you still can't guarantee when you arrive that there's a fire there, right? Like, she yeah. the fan, she's stressed out. He's, he just got yelled at by somebody. He's got a lot of work to do. Somebody's trying to find the right stapler. A lot of things happen. Totally. Where I would say the first thing you do when you arrive, you say, hey, this may take some time. So you know what I want to do with you is walk me through, get, tell me your hot points. What are your expectations? Point some stuff out. And then if you don't mind, can I stay after that and then do my own walkthrough I need details, right? I'm going to take a lot of pictures. I'm going to get some measurements. I don't want to waste your time. This is something I need to do to make sure I give you the best accurate quote I can. I Nine times out of 10, that happens very well for us. They have no problem, unless it's a government building or something where like security. Yeah, you know, It is what it is. I mean, at that point, you might not even be able to take pictures, right? But yeah, in the case of hit them with that expectation up front, You'd be surprised how many times they're going to give you the time to go ahead and do your full walk. I totally agree. That's what we did as well. We put them at ease in the beginning and just say, like, relate to them. I know you're busy. So here's, you know, if we can spend five to 10 minutes together on this, I will go through. And to be clear, I mean, you're going to trust me with or someone else with our cleaners in here when you're not here. So, you know, I want to make sure we set everyone up for success. Okay, good. I, I like that at ease. You know, yeah. Put them at ease. And then if you're just, if you literally just say, I'm here to listen to you. 
Yeah. Give me your hot points. That's the most important thing here. You don't need to be around while I'm doing all this other stuff, right? Because at the end of the day, again, they're just, there's all these little data points that they're gathering about you. Do they trust you? Do they believe in you? And if their first experience is that you've annoyed them, you know, so how do you put them at ease? You know, maybe the other person coming for a quote and a complaint about that or say, I told you on the phone, I need more time. No. They're like, well, this is a, that's a new data point that they're not really enjoying that dynamic, right? So no, yeah. how can you serve them? Well, no, and it's, and it's awesome. Like that, that, again, when we first started testing route two, like that was funny, like to, to show them what we were doing. And then you'd see some clients like look around, like, what are you doing right now? Right? You know, what, what, why are you still? So I, I also understand you want to make, you know, eye contact. So again, another reason to just do the thorough walkthrough after the fact, you know, like in the beginning, just capture notes, listen to them as a client. And again, they're, I find it hard to believe that they will be upset that you're doing such a detailed job, right? Like, I, yeah. they're just, and if they do, that's probably a client you don't even want to work with anyway. Yeah, it might be a bit of a signal. So <laughs> um, we'll go through some rapid fire here. Uh, what's the industry standard for profit margins? Uh, the, probably, there's a two in front of it, right? So I think at least 20%. But if you're a growing business, so like anybody who's at a million and over in revenue, you start to get into five, 10 it's going to be different, right? But I'd say shoot for 20. Uh, I know there's some cases where, you know, 10 to 15 works for us. 30 to 50 is also something we shoot for in different special services. Yep. But 20, anything with a two in front of it, you should be, this is what we should target for. That's awesome. Doug asked um, if you charge uh, more for the first few cleanings to like to, or the first clean to get it up to a serviceable level. You know, I, I'm sure we've all been there. You walk through and the place is, not great. And, yeah. you know, you're, you're basically billing them on a, on a maintenance. How do you bring up that level? Man, I, we do at times, depending on the client, depending on the situation, but that's a great point to just like you, I cannot harp on how important that is. And I freaking still forget, right. People still forget to incorporate that cost. That's almost like a good idea to just make sure I can figure out how to automate that. Because yeah, you tend to forget, right? Um, but again, it, I guess it depends on you as a business owner. Like, cause it, you don't wanna start off with a, a negative notation from the client to say, hey, what the heck, why are you charging me more? But mm -hmm. it, it is a good point to just br to bring up cause it is going to take you longer in the beginning. Alex asks, when performing a walkthrough, do you share your knowledge with the client? For example, what sets your company apart from the competition? Uh, I do. In, in way, I mean, I know even our team, like, you know, some good, like you were touching on before, Mike, is showing them that you know their space, right? Throwing in a little tidbits of, you know, a similar client, you know, but I, I'd say be careful because sometimes you don't even know who that person is. They may have been, they may have gotten fired from that company you just referenced, right? But I'd say just show them that you know how to service this location type. If you're looking and they bring up floors by chance, hit them with the floor services that you offer. Try to drop in those golden nuggets, but don't oversell too much because again, if they are trying to walk through quickly and, and all you're doing is trying to sell them on how much you do and what, you know, COVID, everybody's using COVID cleaning now, right? Like it's good, but just, you know, kind of weigh it out. You're gonna have to feel out when you can drop those nuggets. That's awesome. So uh, we'll got one more question here from Jennifer. After you bid and you hand it over to your team, your, your techs, do you tell them they have X amount of budget of hours to clean or do you just get them to clean the entire scope until it's done and assess? Like, how do you manage, how do you manage yeah. the expectations going in? It's a great That's point. a great point. I mean, we, you, we definitely tell them, you know, this is a little, you know, Rosalato tip that we always do is we try to at least shave 15 point, 15 points, 15 minutes off of what it actually we, we bid the project for because mm. we want to leave a little room because whatever time you tell a cleaning technician, they're going to take that time, right? If you say, hey, this is five days a week, three hours, you know that they're staying there for three hours, right? It is what it is. But I think you definitely want to, to give them an expected time of service that they're going to be in that because then, again, it's easier for us to put it in swept, right? Like, hey, this is a five day a week, three hours a three hour, and then you can get those alerts that they're spending 10 more minutes every day that they're supposed to, because yeah. if you don't 
if that if that's not visible for you to see, you're losing money from day one. Yeah, yeah. The variance report to actually, you know, here's what we said, here's what we've landed. Yeah. So, it, so it, 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 yeah, it's best practice, I would think, to to recognize that number. Awesome. So I want to close out this. Uh, number one, thank you very much, everyone, for attending and the amazing questions. I just want to highlight a couple points in that essentially bidding sets the foundation. So a poor bid, you know, a poor bidding process leads you losing the best contracts and winning the worst. And so if you are in that situation where you're struggling to manage your contracts, I would really recommend that you review your process and reset. Um, and as we've just learned through everything that Ricky shared with us, like he doesn't go out and win bids and hope for the best. He wins profitable contracts, he provides an excellent service, and he keeps his customers happy. So a strong and professional bidding process will help you get those contracts and walk away from the worst. Um, again, let your competitors take the challenging ones, the ones that people are to complain that they don't want to pay. Let them have that because you deserve the profitable ones. Um, you know, Rick, again, thank you so much for joining, um, sharing your knowledge again with the entire industry. It's awesome. We're going to have this up. Anyone who wants to watch this again um, or has come in late, you'll see a video. Any final, Rick's, uh, any final thoughts for us, Rick, before we wrap up? Uh, man, so much to talk about. But just, just know that we're, you know, everybody who's out there working, trying to build a business, know that there is support. There's going to be more support than ever now, right? Everything's digital now. Everything's on the web, right? We're doing Zoom calls. You've got people like me, like Mike, many others in the space that are willing to share. Um, we're a text message, phone call, email away. Because again, my, my main mission is to empower this industry. It's done so much for me as for my family, my employees, my teams. And it's my it's literally my mission to raise the bar. Because if we raise this bar and you know, there's 7% of the jobs in this economy are cleaning oriented right? There's more cleaning businesses being started than ever before. So if we, but we need to get the bidding right because it, it's the foundation to the success of our industry. We cannot let clients gouge us on, on pricing. And it's the people that bid low that, you know, are responsible for that. But it, it's, it's not that they are doing it purposely though. I think it's, they don't have the tools. So we have to do what we can to get those tools to everybody. Because I'm telling you, man, that the, the more spotlight is on us than ever before. And if these client, the clientele respects cleaning already now because of COVID, but it's like, let's match that expectation with a profitable bid. So then now there is no more question of that guy or statement. Well, they charge me 20 an hour, right? Nobody in this industry should charge anybody under than 25 an hour. Like that should be the standard like price right. point in cleaning because that allows any business owner to be able to pay for an employee, to be able to grow a business and really just step the game up for this space. That's awesome. Well said. Thank you very much, Ricky. Thanks everyone. Uh, look forward to connecting. Reach out to us on LinkedIn. We both have uh, YouTube uh, channels with videos, free content. Uh, we're here to help you. We're here to serve you. And uh, yeah, until next time, take care.